Right, so now we will talk about the movements of the large intestine in the colon and beyond. Right, first of all we should know that in the colon or large intestine, the proximal half of it is concerned with the absorption, mainly it absorbs the water and electrolytes. Right, and distal half is concerned with the storage of the fecal matter, right, and elimination of the fecal matter, that is defecation. Now, these are the two primary function and during these when the chyme is look this is small gut and here is ileocecal valve and here is ileocecal sphincter uh, functional sphincter which is uh, you can say slightly thick and smooth muscle layer and don't forget you do have appendix here right now Large gut primary function is to absorption of water and electrolyte in the especially its initial half and distal half uh, mainly it is the storage and elimination of fecal matter and during this process when the chyme enter to the cecum and very slowly it goes through the large intestine to the sigmoid colon uh, it convert from semi solid uh, material to the fecal matter right and uh, the movement of large intestine are most slow here right what I mean by most slow that it will take one to two days for the material to reach from cecum up to the last part of the large intestine. But before I move forward I remember one thing you know in last segment I was teaching that there um, myoclo what was that MMCs. MMCs are feature of stomach and feature of small intestine but they are not the feature of large, large intestine number one. Secondly when um, MMCs occur in small intestine I forget to mention there that MMC strongly stimulate the gallbladder and help to clear the bill uh, to clear the or empty the biliary ducts also. Is that right? So please add it there. Now we come to back. Before I really go into detail of movement of large gut, I will talk about ileocecal valve and sphincter. Right? Ileocecal valve is a small part of the ileum with its mucosa protruding into cecum. And proximal to that, there is a thickened ring of smooth muscle which act as ileocecal functional sphincter. Now, ileocecal sphincter and ileocecal valve, uh, they are regulated very well, especially by the cecum. Is that right? Normally, they remain tightly closed, ileocecal valve, and they only work one way from ileum to the cecum because cecum is highly, you can say, populated with bacteria. But in the ileum, where it is sterile or bacterial population is very low. So one of the major function of ileocecal valve is to prevent the highly bacterial population from the cecum to the small gut, right? Secondly, uh, ileocecal sphincter is very properly regulated, right? For example, when content in the cecum become more, ileocecal valve should become tight. Because if pressure in the cecum is increasing, there is a danger of spilling of cecal large intestinal gut into ileum. So actually, when pressure in the cecum increases, the uh, ileocecal valve and sphincter tightly close. Right? We can say it's a type of uh, cecoileal reflex. Right? Of course, uh, this should be cecoileal reflex. Uh, should be maintained through local myenteric reflexes also plus it is also maintained through the sympathetic prevertebral sympathetic ganglion right that fibers from the sensory fibers from the cecum will go and st uh, and sympathetic ganglion through the simple uh, sympathetic ganglion fibers will come back to the what is this yeah. ileocecal uh, sphincter and tighten it up is that right but gastroileal reflex opens it when you take a a decent meal right then what happened there is gastro from stomach to the ileocecal valve they right so gastro ileal reflex that when you are taking meal and your stomach is stretching ileum is activated right that actually also relaxes this valve so that content of the small gut go to the large gut and so that small gut can accommodate the incoming chyme from the stomach this is the right so gastro ileal reflexes opening the valve is that right and now we come to 
large gut after having discussed this. In the large gut, let's talk about the type of movements. Number one, there are special type of mixing movements here and which are called hostrations. Hostrations. Right? What are hostrations? Hostrations are that, let me draw here more appropriately. Hostrations are the appearance of constriction at smooth muscle smooth muscle contractions right smooth muscles contract right at intervals in the large gut and when those smooth muscle in muscularis externa contract they make the lumen narrow and in between the two contractions uh, wall of the colon bulges out like a bag swollen bag is that right? Actually, two processes occur here. Number one, smooth muscle contract. Is that right? And make it what? Circular constriction. Secondly, tinea coli also contract and shorten the large gut. So when large gut segment becomes shortened and at multiple constriction ring appear, right? Then large gut areas in between the constriction ring will convert like swollen bags. These bags are called hostra. These bags are called hostra and such movements are called hostration. So what are hostrations? These are movement in which at, at almost regular interval, smooth muscles of large gut constrict and tinea coli also contract, constrict. When smooth muscle constrict, they reduce the luminal diameter and produce the constriction rings. And when large gut tinea coli contract, they shorten that segment. In the, due to this reason, uh, large intestinal content, right, are compressed in between the these construction and this act as a mixing movement and like this uh, these construction dug into the you can say semi solid material there and chop it again and again because hostrations appear and then again appear then after some time again appear you are getting it so at different sites so in this way they bring different areas of semi solid content of large gut to exposure to the where to the mucosa so that uh, water and electrolytes can be absorbed and gradually the semi-fluid content of large gut convert into semi-solid fecal matter. Am I clear? Right? So these bags are called hostra. H-A-U hostra. And these movements, mixing movements which produce hostra, they are called hostrations. Any question up to here? Right? Then another thing, while these hostrations are produced, there can be very weak propulsion also. There can be very weak propulsion and content may spill from one hostra to the next hostra. Is that right? And these very weak movement which I can push the content from one bag of hostra to the next bag of hostra, these movements are called segmental propulsions. So there are segmental seculations. These are hostrations. And there are segmental propulsions. Let me write it here. Mixing movements are number one, segmental. What is this? Segmental hostra production. That is hostrations. Second movement can be segmental. Yes. Propulsions. These are very weak. They are not very strong. And they just push content from one hostra to the next. Is that right? That is called segmental propulsions, right? Then there can be very important movement. If you forget all of the things, I don't care. But now what I'm going to tell you, you must remember, that is the mass movement. Mass movement actually uh, occurs in different people uh, with different frequency per day, right? Uh, usually... In some people, mass movement occur one to three times in a day and in other people, mass movement may occur up to ten times per day. Now, mass movement are very important. What are mass movement? Right? Mass movement, let me tell you how a mass movement is produced. A strong construction ring is produced, let's suppose here. Very strong construction ring is produced and this area becomes very narrow and then distilled to it for about 20 centimeter, hostrations disappear. Hostrations disappear for this segment. And then look, all these hostrations distilled to the ring disappear. Suppose this area has become now very 
narrow due to this very powerful construction drain and distal to area hostration disappear but look here all of it like one tube from all side compresses right so all of it actually become compressed and when all of it become compressed what it will do the contents which are present in this about 15 to 20 centimeter of the lumen they will be pushed and mass distally again let me repeat what are mass movement let me put it here it has nothing to do with uh, mass okay let me explain what is mass movement now in mass movement different people develop with different frequencies per day but usually they come after many hours most commonly they appear within one hour of breakfast you know that, that is what uh, leads many people to the defecation right within one hour of taking breakfast mass movement may appear 10 to 30, 20 minutes right what are mass movement but they may occur in other times of the day also what are mass movement mass movements are a very strong construction ring appear in a part of a colon and then about 20 centimeter distal to that area hostations disappear and all that area contract as as one unit and push the content and mass as one, one mass distally and then mass movement may appear here and push the content forward and if multiple mass movement come and lot of contents are pushed into rectum desire for defecation will be there because normally rectum is kept empty it's a wrong, uh, some students have a wrong concept that rectum is all the time full no usually most of the day and night rectum is kept empty why because contents of uh, a residual you can say material or the fecal matter is uh, in the second half of the colon but number one there is a functional weak functional thickening of smooth muscle at recto sigmoidal junction that prevent the overflow of material into rectum secondly there is acute angulation here that also prevent overfilling of the rectum so normally rectum is almost empty is that right but when multiple mass movements are generated they push the material to the rectum that produces the desire for defecation am i clear and these mass movement once they start usually they persist for 10 to 30 minutes they keep on reminding that if you need to go to for, de, for bathroom for defecation right or anywhere for the defecation it depends on your choice now now we come to another thing that mass movement can be initiated by gastrocolic reflex you know many people when they take a heavy meal and within a short time they need to go to washroom for defecation why because there may be gastrocolic reflex again this gastrocolic reflex may be coming through yes sympathetic ganglion or it may be coming through yes right uh, it may be uh, coming through central system right so what is there the gastrocolic reflex stimulated plus it can also be initiated by duodenocolic reflex right to further enhance mass movement because when duodenum is also stretched it means you have really eaten a lot so you need to evacuate it in the, at the end any question up to this no question so what, what are mass movements? They are highly, these are high amplitude movements and they are propagating contractions, right? Now we, now we come to defecation reflex, that how the defecation reflex work. Is that right? So we have talked about the mixing movement in large gut, which are hostations. We have talked about segmental propulsion, which are very weak propulsive movement. And then we have talked about the mass movement, which are the most important to remember, which occur in the colon and which can push a large amount of uh, colon luminal contents and mass distally. And if they push your material up to the rectum, that may initiate the desire for. Now we come to the defecation reflex. Let's understand it with clarity because this is very important to understand. But before really I go into defecation reflex, uh, I would like to ask that normally, of course, healthy person does not have dribbling. Healthy person who has gone through toilet training and uh, including the children who have been toilet trained, uh, they don't keep on dribbling their fecal matter. 
how the dribbling of fecal matter is prevented normally how the dribbling of fecal matter is prevented you don't want to tell me it's no secret most of the doctors know yes Yes, that is simply by the internal and external anal sphincters. Internal anal sphincters is here, right? And this is a ring of smooth muscles. Actually, uh, in the muscularis externa, the smooth muscle layer becomes very thick as it reaches. What is this? Anus. Secondly, I will give a little different color. And outside, outer to this, there is skeletal muscle which act as what external anal sphincter right so what we can say there is internal anal sphincter and there is external anal sphincter let me draw it again this is internal anal right and here we have overlapping it external anal sphincter right now internal anal sphincter is involuntary it's part of smooth muscle and external anal sphincter thank god can be controlled voluntarily right now uh, and there's a role of what there is a role of central nervous system also into this situation. So let me draw it. Right. Now, what really happens? How the defecation reflex is initiated? Actually, As I told you previously, normally rectum is kept empty. Is that right? But whenever rectum will become full and rectal mucosa is stimulated, desire for the defecation is initiated. Normally what happens, before the desire for defecation start, the multiple mass movement. As I told you, mass movement can be initiated by the what? Gastrocolic reflex or by the duodenocolic reflex or spontaneously few times a day. Once the mass movement are there and if there are enough fecal content over there, right, then this fecal content will be pushed through the descending colon and sigmoid colon into rectum. And when rectum receives these contents, when the rectum receives these fecal contents, right, these are the contents which are pushed forward, right. When rectum receives these contents and there is rectal stretching and irritation to rectal mucosa, number one, Local reflex, myenteric reflex is stimulated. Is that right? What is that myenteric reflex? Actually, the local sensory system stimulates the ascending pathway and this ascending myenteric system stimulates all the way up. It stimulates all the way up. And this stimulation creates more mass movement. Is that right? So it means once the rectum is slightly stretched, right this will what it will do through the myenteric reflexes the ascending pathway will st uh, stimulate the transverse colon descending colon and of course sigmoid colon and all of them become stimulated and when all of them are stimulated that will lead to movement of more fe fecal material here and at the same time look here not only in ascending pathway that it stimulates suppose this was the sensory sensations from this area ascendingly they stimulate but descendingly especially internal anal sphincter they inhibit of course by releasing the VIP and nitric oxide right so what you have to remember first initial mass movement filling of the rectum 
right? Rectal stimulation actually stimulates the myenteric plexus strongly, right? And ascending pathway stimulates the, what is this? More proximal part of colon and more mass movement bring more fecal material here. At the same time, what is there? Relaxation of internal inner sphincter. Is that right? Secondly, this intrinsic defecation reflex, this is intrinsic reflex because no other outer part of the nervous system has been involved. So what should be this reflex called? Yes, this reflex should be called intrinsic defecation reflex or intrinsic myenteric to remember it more clearly intrinsic myenteric defecation reflex usually this intrinsic myenteric reflex is weak and remember one thing as soon as the smooth muscle in the internal anal sphincter relaxes if we are not ready for defecation we actually consciously can contract external anal sphincter you are understanding no, look, look, look. This is very important to understand. When fecal matter come here, mm -hmm. so sensations in the rectal mucosa stimulate the myenteric plexus proximally as well as distally. Sorry, it stimulates the proximally and inhibits distally. When it stimulates proximally, more mass movement bring more material and distally it inhibits the internal anal sphincter. Thank God, again, we have external anal sphincter. Actually, we reflexly close it. If we are at some inappropriate situation, you are watching a video and you cannot go rush to the washroom, what you will do? That you will keep your external anal sphincter tight. Right? This is one thing. Secondly, when more material come, right, this weak reflex can be amplified or intensified by parasympathetic reflex. How? Look here. These some of the sensory fibers from where? What is this? Rectal stretch area and mucosa. They go to the spinal cord, lower part, into conus medullaris as 2, 3 and 4. Right? And from here, parasympathetic fibers come through nervi or genti or pelvic nerve and these parasympathetic fibers, look now, they stimulate what? Listen, fibers from here, sensory fiber went to sacral part of spinal cord. From here, outflow come. This outflow further inhibit what? Internal anal sphincter. And this outflow further stimulates what? Myenteric intrinsic reflex. It intensifies that. You know when parasympathetic stimulation comes, myenteric system becomes amplified. So what really happens that intrinsic myenteric reflex for defecation system is weak, right? And what really happens along with this intrinsic rectal stimulation with more incoming fecal matter stimulates the parasympathetic outflow from, sec from sacral segments and through the pelvic nerves parasympathetic outflow comes and it further stimulates the myenteric system. Right? And the result is that that intrinsic reflex become more intensified or amplified. So there are more strong and more fre more stronger which movement? Mass movement. Along with that more stronger relaxation of what? Internal sphincter. But if you really don't want to go to washroom and it's not nearby, what you do? You keep your external anal sphincter now consciously tight. Is that right? Until if you remain like this, what will happen? You know, sensory system will think that you are not responding. And when you don't respond to someone, what happens? Response goes down. Same thing happened here. When you are not responding to this defecation call, intrinsic defecation reflex, amplified by, what is this? Parasympathetic defecation reflex. If you are not responding to that and keeping it tight for a while, then rectal uh, sensory fibers will get used to this high pressure. So for a while, this reflex will die out. But after some time, depending upon how urgent is the situation, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 1 hour, 2 hour, again the call will come. But let's suppose this time, you just make it tight and you go to the washroom. And if you reach there, now you are comfortably sitting there, right? And now you really want to defecate. What you will do? One thing is, this decision, uh, conscious decision to make defecation is done at the higher center. Right? You really think about it. You, you should defecate. So what will happen? That from higher centers, fibers will come down 
and they will control the outflow of what are these fibers. This is pudendal nerve. What is this? Pudendal nerve which control the external anal sphincter. So what you do that you inhibit the outflow through pudendal, pudendal nerve and external anal sphincter also relaxes. Is that right? So internal anal sphincter was already relaxed. But sometimes it happens, by the time you go to washroom, right, the desire for defecation has been reduced, or we can say desire is there, but this pathway, look, this whole system is reduced. So what you can do, you can amplify it by conscious effort. So you take a deep breath, close your glottis, and then what you do, contract your abdominal muscles and diaphragm. What you are doing? You are raising the intra-abdominal pressure. Right? Actually, you are squeezing the whole colon to push more material there. So that this pathway is again stimulated and parasympathetic system is also stimulated. You understand it? Valsalva maneuver. Right? Especially if you feel that if you are in rush to do defecation and maybe on two minutes you have to be out or someone is knocking at the door. Yes, there are so many situations. Or you are a person who wants to save time everywhere. So, under those circumstances, what you do? You close your glottis. Right? Contract abdominal muscle, then diaphragm, right? Of course, diaphragm downward, abdominal muscle inward, and increase intra-abdominal pressure. pressure. At the same time, you relax the muscles of pelvic floor. The muscles of pelvic floor is relaxed, right? That also help the anal external anal sphincter to come out, outward, right? And at the same time, uh, you have inhibited consciously, what is this? Pudendal nerve and external anal sphincter become relax. When internal anal sphincter is relaxed, at the same time external anal sphincter is relaxed, at the top you are pressing the whole system like that, right, then what will happen? That this reflects intrinsic, what intrinsic? Intrinsic defecation reflex with parasympathetic defecation reflex, which are automatic, they become further amplified and they move the content outward and defecation start. Am I clear? So what are the three important uh, steps you have to remember? What are the important steps for defecation? Listen, number one is mass movements. Mass movement. Number two, filling of rectum. Number three, yes, desire for defecation. Desire for defecation. And at the same time, three A is desire and three B is as soon as rectum is filled, this stimulate what? Myenteric, intrinsic myenteric reflex. Intrinsic myenteric reflex reflex, right, which increases the movement and internal anal sphincter relaxes. But if situation is inappropriate, right, if the situation is inappropriate, socially it is not acceptable to defecate whatever you are doing, then what you will do? You will contract, contract external anal sphincter and gradually that reflex will die out. But if it is you uh, go to washroom and you are comfortable and you decide really to go for defecation, what will you do? The next step should be that you will do the falsalva maneuver. Maneuver. What is that? That basically you will close, take a deep breath in. What are the components of this? Take a deep breath in, right? Close the glottis, then contract abdominal muscles and diaphragm, raise into abdominal pressure so that colonic colon contents can be pushed forward further right plus relax what is that pelvic floor muscles right and uh, once you have initiated the valsalva maneuver at the same time you, you inhibit what is that inhibit external anal sphincter and defecation should occur hopefully is that right any question here there's no question. Now, a few important uh, things about the disorders of GIT motility, right? Just few words I will talk about these disorders of the GIT motility. Number one, ileus, paralytic ileus. Paralytic ileus is when the whole myenteric plexus in GIT becomes paralyzed. This type of situation is seen after general anesthesia or it is seen when abdominal surgery and you manually uh, handle the gastrointestinal system or when there is severe electrolyte imbalance, right? So, or there is septicemia or there is peritonitis. So, anything which generally irritates the uh, GIT, 
that may lead to paralysis of myenteric plexus and gastrointestinal movement stops. That is called ileus, right? The classical example is uh, general anesthesia and postoperatively, but after some time it recovers. Is that right? Uh, then this is one condition. Second condition is Hirschsprung's disease. Disease. In this disease, this is usually congenital condition. What happen? Uh, one segment in the large intestine does not have ganglion and neuronal cell bodies. You know that these uh, in myenteric plexus and submucosal plexus, both of them, they get neuronal cell bodies or ganglia from the migration of neural crest cells. Sometimes neural crest cells don't migrate properly and in some segment of the large intestine, uh, ganglia will not be there. We say that there is a ganglionic segment. And when there is a ganglionic segment, what happens? Let me explain. This is congenital cause of megacolon. But these ganglion can be destroyed by uh, a parasite called trypanosoma, trypanosoma cruz. That can also destroy these ganglion and that can produce also similar megacolon type situation. But classically, what, what happens in these cases? Let's suppose this is large gut. Suppose this segment does not have ganglion. If this segment does not have ganglion, then what will happen? All the food matter which is coming here, it will accumulate proximal to that. Because this will remain semi-contracted. Why it remains semi-contracted aganglionic area? Because there is failure of relaxation. You know when peristalsis will bring the food content here, normally more distal area to the peristaltic ring should relax. But because uh, there are no ganglia here and no neurons here, myenteric system, so peristalsis are bringing or you can say propulsive movements are bringing a lot of uh, content in the lumen of GIT just, just proximal to the aganglionic segment. But a ganglionic segment itself is cannot generate relaxation, right? So it does not uh, receive and accommodate incoming contents. So what really happens in these patients, this part of the colon become very much dilated, proximal to that. That is why this is also called megacolon. The treatment of such situation is of course, if unfortunately baby is born with this, it's more common in male babies. What will happen? There will be delay in passage of meconium. Plus because contents in GAT are retained and then baby starts throwing up and there is nausea and vomiting and all those things. Uh, treatment of this is a surgical resection of a ganglionic segment. Am I clear? Then another condition which is there is irritable bowel syndrome. There is, this is very common condition. Irritable don't confuse it with inflammatory bowel disease. That is entirely a different category of disease. I'm talking about irritable bowel syndrome. In these syndrome, the patient suffer with abdominal pain, vague abdominal pain, and with that, so they, they repeatedly suffer with dysfunction of GIT motility. Sometimes they develop diarrhea, sometimes they develop constipation, right? And this irritable bowel syndrome is now thought to be due to increased visceral hypersensitivity that in gastrointestinal system the sensory neurons which are supposed to move the myenteric plexus they are over sensitive is that right so they are over sensitive so visceral hypersensitivity is there and that leads to exaggerated intestinal reflexes that leads to exaggerated intestinal reflexes right and due to that reason these people may have repeated diarrheas, right, or abdominal pain when the exaggerated movement in the GIT. Clear? Then last but not the least is fecal incontinence. There can be many reasons for fecal incontinence, right? But more common are when these neurons, what are these neurons? Parasympathetic, uh, sorry, what is this? Neurons which control the external anal sphincter, right? They are disrupted right or higher control to the sacral area is interrupted for example if you have a lien in spinal cord above the conus medullaris right and higher control cannot come down now what happens that this if there is no higher control the function of this higher control on 
lower spinal reflexes was that when the socially it is not acceptable you should defecate what you do you inhibit the defecation reflexes and when you are in washroom and you want to defecate consciously you can slightly assist the defecation process by producing valsalva maneuver and relaxing the external anal sphincter is that right when this contract uh, this is lost what really happen after some days all the system start over firing and if conus medullaris itself is functional just it is not it has lost its higher control then what happens these reflexes they become automatic am i clear and those automatic feature right that whenever fecal matter is reaching here right it will stimulate first of all intrinsic re reflex then stimulate the parasympathetic reflex but if in lower motor neurons if external anal sphincters you know these fibers are over firing this may lead to retention is that right usually it need to incontinence but if pudendal nerve is over firing you remember that some of the lower motor neurons when they are no more controlled by the upper motor neuron they start over firing if it's over firing there will be some degree of what retention of fecal matter but giving a little enema here right every morning you can initiate the defecation reflex and get the stuff out is that right any question up to this uh, uh, i am talking about when lien is in the nervous system above the conus medullaris so conus medullaris of so sacral area of the spinal cord is functional but it is no more controlled by the descending pathways so consciously we cannot alter the or override the spinal reflex under these circumstances that becomes semi semi automatic system am i clear in that case what really happens if visceral this intrinsic reflex and parasympathetic reflex is very strong whenever fecal matter reaches here person will automatically evacuate but if but if external pudendal nerve is very strong then it will lead to retention okay. you are getting it under those circumstances we can give uh, enema in the morning usually we do to these patients after the food so what happens why after the food we are taking the help of gastro colic reflex plus that uh, that enema will irritate this area and distend this area and these reflexes will become powerful enough to override the external anal sphincter and get the stuff out is that right any question here okay class dismissed